Thanks so much for joining us today. I wanted to ask you about redistricting. Does the current system as it's set up now work? Yes, the answer is yes, the current system works. Any time in the la since 1990 that there's been a court case, after the citizens voted for the redistricting commission in 1994, the court case has been about basically regions of the state that felt like they weren't represented either because of one person, one vote, or the other expectation, which is keeping counties whole. Um, there has not been a case of partisan warfare in the courts as a result of the commission. So as I see it right now, the commission has done a really good job of um, ensuring everybody has the one person, one vote, of keeping counties together as best as possible, and ensuring that communities of like interest stay in the same districts. So it works really well. But a six person commission with three people nominated from each party has a lot of potential for deadlock. So why not put an odd person in there to avoid that potential in the first place? So the argument that you need a fourth person actually pushes away from what the original uh, intention of the commission was. And that is that six people are gonna get into a room, they're gonna collaborate, and they're gonna reach agreement. There has not been a deadlock in, in the commission that was a three to three vote that killed a commission. It's been other things that have resulted in court cases, but there has not been a deadlock. So the fact that, that the majority is making the argument that you need a seventh member, if you look at the history, it's, it's just not true. So what happened in the last week and are we making progress in the two parties coming to a compromise? Well, uh, the majority needs to make the case that a six member commission has failed Idaho. And in my opinion, they have failed to make that case. The six member commissions that we've had in 2000 and 2012 did their job, they worked in a bipartisan fashion, and while there were some court cases that resulted in having to redraw the maps, it wasn't because of partisanship. It was because of essentially one of three things. First, one person, one vote, which is at the top, the most predominant measure from the Supreme Court. Subordinate to that is cutting up counties. Um, and in my opinion, the majority has made no rational argument for why you would need to add a member to the commission. There are a number of proposals that the Republicans put forth that the minority party disagrees with. So why the protest last week on the House floor where you use procedural moves to slow down House business? Because it's important to me that there's fairness. The majority controls 80% of the legislature. In controlling 80% of the legislature, they can basically do whatever they want. And I'm okay with that. I exist in the minority as a uh, person who does the best I possibly can for the communities that I represent. But in this case, they were using their basically undrained power to actually do a power grab at the redistricting level. Um, for me, that was representative of behavior that I thought was unbecoming of the decorum of the house. And as a result, I decided to read bills in protest. Are you okay with, say, the House Liberty Caucus or, or the House Freedom Caucus using those same procedural moves to slow down business if they're unhappy about how things are going? I think that it is a right that all, every legislator has. And in fact, there was a representative who called me on the floor who at one point in time had to read bills herself. And I was prepared to read every bill myself um, if that's what it took to make my point about fairness in the state of Idaho. So let's say the Republicans reach out to you and want to compromise. Are there any proposals or any changes that would make a seven member redistricting commission palatable to the Democrats? I'm happy to have conversations with my Republican colleagues about what they wanna do. Um, but I go back to my original stances. You need to make a coherent, rational argument based on the history of the commission that shows that we need a seventh member. And they have failed to do that under any circumstances. Have they, have they shown that six member commissions were the reason that a redistricting case landed in the Supreme Court? And if you look at why they landed in the Supreme Court, again, it was almost always a regional fight where a county was cut up and so that county was limited in their representation or they felt that the county, that the area was cut up in a way that they actually were limited in their representation nothing to do with party. And so I'm happy to have conversations with them. I'm happy to even 
have conversations with them about why they think they need a seventh member, but I don't think that collaboration and cooperation is a bad word. And I think a supermajority to redraw the maps after population shift every 10 years is a reasonable expectation. So the Republicans disagree with you, obviously, and have shown that they feel that there is a seventh member needed. So what happens if or when this comes back to the House floor? If they go through the processes and it's a fair process, then we understand our role. Our, our objection to this was they tried to run a constitutional amendment through the entire House in about 48 hours, um, which isn't fair. Um, in addition to the fact that it was essentially creating a machine for gerrymandering and it was, it was unabashed about it. I mean, it was a machine for gerrymandering. And uh, so that uh, opposition was there. Now, if, if they want to do something else and we can't stop them, um, great. But here's the thing. Voters don't like cheaters. And if they redraw the commission and can't make the case that it was needed, the voters are going to see right through it and they're going to vote it down. So let's say that this does pass the legislature and the governor does sign this. It will, as you said, go to the voters. What does the Democratic Party do to, to fight this? You know, I don't think it's as much about the Democratic Party as it is about people who don't want their state to be like Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Florida, these states where they have spent millions upon millions of dollars trying to rewrite maps that were blatantly gerrymandered to either pack people of a certain belief or a certain value into a district or crack people into other districts. It's, it's really common. Um, by keeping a six member commission, you almost assure that we're not gonna have millions and millions of dollars in gerrymandering court cases. And so it isn't the Democratic Party that will lead that opposition, it's people who really recognize that a power grab at the Independent Redistricting Commission um, will result in worse representation for the people of Idaho. But let's say the voters disagree with you, do you respect the will of the voters? Oh, <laughs> I think that that's part of it, yes. Uh, but I don't think the voters will vote for it. There was another issue in front of the House this week uh, involving rule changes. Mm -hmm. Currently, the way uh, Idaho rules are set up on an administrative level, different departments put <clears throat> rules into place during the off season of the legislature, and then when you come back into session, both the House and the Senate committees vote on those rules, whether or not to approve them. And how the setup is now is if just one House says yes, it doesn't really matter what the other one does, they can deny it or amend it, but as long as one House passes it, then it stands. There was a proposal to change this from House Majority Leader Mike Moyle that both would have to agree and requiring more of an affirmative um, act as opposed to a passive act. You oppose this, why is that? Well, I spoke with Representative Moyle about it before we opposed it, and uh, my feeling is, let's just take the climate change issue that popped up last year. Senate approved the climate change educational um, standards and the House rejected them. If the House had rejected them and the Senate approved them under Mike's, uh, Representative Moyle's um, current proposal, there would be no science standards for climate change because one House could uh, reject a rule set. The problem with that is the way the bill is drafted is it now encourages committee chairmen to put rules in their drawers knowing full well that if it doesn't come out for a public hearing, the rule's rejected. So how, it, how does it encourage that? It concentrates power in the committee chairman's hands where if, if for some reason there's a rule that they're not interested in hearing or they voted against a bill the previous year and now the rules are before them in their committee, they can drop it in their drawer and if they drop it in their drawer and the, sen and the uh, body doesn't pick it up, then the rule is effectively dead. When that happens, now your executive branch is operating under temporary rules, and temporary rules are the most confusing thing for the public. So what you've done is you've created an environment where you've consolidated power in committee chairman's hands, and you force the executive branch to operate in a temporary rule aspect, which will create an immense amount of confusion for the public. So I opposed it on those grounds. The other thing is, I was on board with the Constitutional Amendment, which was HJR 5 in 2016, to enshrine in the Constitution that the legislature had the right to look at and, and approve or reject rules. When we pitched that to the public, we pitched it exactly as it is right now, and now we're changing it 
um, because we didn't get, you know, I'm not really sure why Representative Moyle brought the bill, but to me it, to me it kind of like is a, is a swipe at the voter. Do you imagine if this passes the Senate that it gets vetoed? I'm almost sure that it will get vetoed. All right. Yeah. Well, Representative Matt Erpelding, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.